I'll hold up my book for everyone. Here's the book. There it is. Isn't it? The little great? gem, the little masterpiece. I, I just, um, when I got it in my hands, I thought the cover was so beautiful. It and, really is. You know? It really is. Yeah. yeah. Did a friend do it? Her name's Chief Ladybird, and she's also indigenous. And she's oh, in Canada. Oh, neat. Yeah. Find this tattoo. Well, it's hard to see it. I have a tattoo here. Oh. And we designed that as well. And so when they started to do the book cover, I said, you know, I know I want to do it if we can get her to do it. And, um, and they there did. It there so, it is. Wow. Um, Very nice. Yeah. So the, the book, um, I don't know if you've heard this story before, but in my tribe, there's a, um, a flood story. So like a lot of cultures have floods. Yes. Stories. We have it's a flood not story. in the book. Yes, we're yeah, there. Yeah, uh -huh. you know, everything's flooded and um, original man is sitting on a log with all the animals and they're all kind of wondering what's going to happen. And the only animal that can get to the bottom of the water is the little muskrat who the muskrat. You know, the, the most unlikely hero goes all the way down and he dies going down to the water and he pulls up, you know, dirt in his little fist and then they make land with it. What a yeah. neat story. Wow. I think it's beautiful. Your and own version of Noah's Ark, huh? Yeah, yeah. and I was yeah. talking to my kids about the story yesterday. We were talking about, you know, this is the the little animal that no one thought could do it, and he was so brave in making this happen and recreating the land again. And um, I just keep thinking about this time we're living in of – you know, not knowing what's on the other side, kind of like they didn't know what was on the other side of the earth. So and what true. Like. Yeah. yeah. And most people have never seen a muskrat or wouldn't <laughs> know what it looked like. I'm not sure I would. Yeah, I don't think I would either. <laughs> yeah, it's a, in the rodent family, so it's not the, yeah, yeah. the hero we would assume, you know. We would pick, yeah, yeah. I think uh, one thing that I wanted to talk to you about and what I've realized since this book came out is my first book, Glory Happening, was kind of as I was starting to deconstruct some things from my childhood faith, you know? Yes. I was just starting to consider, you know, mystery instead of just God or patriarchal views of he as God. Thank and God. <laughs> I think, and then I think after beginning deconstruction, I was able to move into what this book does, which is more decolonizing. And I think it's an interesting, oh. I've been thinking about the, the steps that I had to take from one, from deconstruction to decolonizing, that they're a little different. And for me, I don't think I could have gotten to the decolonizing stage without the deconstruction first. Like it was kind of a primer almost for me. And I've been thinking about that a lot uh, throughout, just since the book came out. Can you give me a one sentence definition how you're using those two terms? Yeah, so in my mind, deconstruction is examining those systems, right, that we grew up in. Yes, yes. And then decolonizing to me is looking at these systems of colonization, whether it's the church or America, whatever, yes. and actually trying to figure out how to dismantle them within our own lives or or on the bigger level as a society. But for me, I'm trying to do it in my own life and in my family's life. And, yes. you know, and so in my mind, deconstruction is like uh, sort of beginning to look and, yes. and pick apart a little. And then decolonizing is, is really trying to take it apart and see what comes. Further stage of it. That makes yeah. sense? I think so, but I've never heard anybody put it that clearly. And of course, you know, not everybody would have that definition, I don't think. But yeah. it works. It works. And, you know, in, in your book, I don't sense negativity, which is one reason I have always trusted you since the beginning. If you can do deconstruction and decolonizing without becoming a cynic, that's the miracle. That's... Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very hard. And I very I, hard, very I hard. I thought about that just since the book came out too, because you start thinking about these things and thinking about like the youth group that I grew up in and all of these different institutions that I loved and were they were a safe place for me. But now I have to look back and say, okay, this was 
colonization that I participated in. You know, this was assimilation that I participated in. And how can I be better now for my children or for myself? You know, how can I change that and make it better? Because the cost was parts of myself. You know, I lo- I parts of me were pushed down, you know, and yeah. I would listen to those parts. And that's what this journey has been. Um, and would you say, Caitlin, that that is also recognizing the parts that were good about it. Huh? Yeah. 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 And I didn't want to write a book that was just all the negative, you know, yeah, so I, I wanted to anybody. try it. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't help anybody. That's good. But yeah. you got to do it. <laughs> I know. And, and to allow, you know, allow myself to be angry because yes, I didn't grow up with right. anger wasn't allowed. I was a people pleaser and very forced happiness sort of, you know, I could feel sad, but I couldn't ever be angry. I I never let myself. And so as an adult, yeah, Yeah. allowing myself to feel anger about things, but also recognize that liminal space, the tension in it. Now, did you get that from Christianity or from uh, your own culture too? I think from the church because I... I started leading worship and doing all those things from like oh, yeah. 12. Oh, oh. I mean, I did it all through. And so I was a leader. And if you're a yeah. leader and you're a woman, yeah. you need to look happy and presentable. And yes. you know? Yeah, me too. I would say the same. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mainly from misunderstood church teaching or Jesus teaching the things that he never taught really Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. so are we recording already caitlin yep it's going good good good. okay didn't have to push any buttons i thought i would um read a poem from the book all right let's do that it's a it's one of the short ones i thought it'd be fun to read one of these let me find it i was really grateful to include the poetry because yes, I was really glad that they let me, you know, sort of sneak them in. <laughs> so. All right, here's one. I am often in my own way. Instead of experiencing the universe, I write about experiencing the universe. While at that moment, the wind had holy secrets to tell me. Mm. And I, uh, yeah, that was just one of those where I was rec- I was realizing that I was still in my head. You know, I was still, um, we try our best to kind of pay attention to the yeah. world around us, but we're still thinking about it. Yeah, I think every one of us has to go through that realization mm-hmm. that we're still one or two steps removed from the thing in itself. Mm-hmm. Every one of us has to, but you did it rather young. Good for you. <laughs> working on it I think uh the other part of this you know what I wanted to do with the book was um get sort of give people people permission to know that they will always be transforming and learning yeah because I think we in some ways have created a culture where you have to arrive somewhere yeah, and then very it's much like so. you think it's over and we force it younger and younger I think on ourselves and I just, I want to give people permission to know that it, this is, you know, decolonizing for me is going to take my whole life. It's always going to be part of my journey and um, where I'll take some steps forward and some steps back and it's a cycle. It's not linear, you know, all these different ways of trying to understand that we can be asking these hard questions our whole life. No matter how. That's the only way to understand spirituality. Yeah. In an evolutionary way. And one of the great disservices born again language did to Christians was give you the uh, terrible impression it was a one time transactional event. Right. Horrible, really. It made most of our life insignificant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I remember um, in, in church you know, one time we had to write our testimony. So we had to tell our, you know, write our whole story down. And yes. It was kind of like, you know, okay, before you were saved, tell us how bad you were. And <laughs> I got saved at age seven. 
And Seven. so I was trying to look back on my life my first seven years to find the places where I was bad. I was trying to find the sin. And to be honest, I couldn't find any because I was like, I'm a good kid, you know, I, but, I, but I was forcing it. I was like that one time I got mad or, you know, that one sure. time I was probably a disobeyed mad. mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I became obsessed with, you become obsessed with trying to find your sins everywhere. Yeah. Whether it was that to growing up Catholic when you, oh, when yeah. you make our first confession around seven and every one of us thought up sins. And I, I used to hear them here at the parish, these innocent little kids coming in at seven and you could tell it was no sense of evil and there wasn't any evil there. So they manufactured pseudo evil, which trivialized evil. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh. That's very true. From the yeah. Very beginning. Yeah. And I think one thing when we taught at the retreat last year together, I was thinking yes. about, you know, um, we're trying to get away from these dualities, but then people want to know well, what is really evil and yeah. um, and what's if if we're getting away from dualism, how can we name something as evil? You know, I think that's a question that everyone comes to. And, um, and I, you know, was tr I'm trying to articulate that in the book as well, while recognizing that so many people really do live in these liminal spaces. We, you know, our ethics and our morals are all, I don't know if we're really that right and wrong. I think we live in the middle, in the murky part somewhere yeah. most of the time. That's why uh, so many of us love the, the Taoist symbol, you know, of the, the white having a little dot of black it's yeah. unfortunately a little racist but and the black having yeah. a little dot of white but the point is still well made yeah thank you what do you think um the value of these sort of intergenerational conversations are within christianity right now intergenerational mm-hmm explain a little more because i'm old and we're talking together <laughs> okay um since you like you and i taught last summer uh -huh. i've been thinking about i'm teaching with some other people who are older than i am and so yes. we have these kinds of conversations where we are learning from each other's experiences on yes. these ends of life you know have you found that to be um helpful to you in the last few years very much so uh but it's it's mainly your generation that I find fruitful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the baby boomers that immediately followed my generation, I don't know that they so often went to depth or went to meaning that I found helpful. That's mm -hmm. all I can say. They seem to have been so trapped in the American system, the church system, either in totally buying it or totally reacting against it. And there's something about millennials that, uh, which is more than half of our staff, as you know here. Yeah. It's just so much more fruitful. You, you stopped overreacting mm -hmm. while still being willing to deconstruct and decolonize. And so to, to to talk to people of your generation, and I hope it continues, is, uh, is an exercise in experiencing, okay, here are the patterns that, that keep showing themselves, that these must be the important ones, uh, mm -hmm. that you, you come up with the same things. Right. Uh, that I thought I was dealing with, uh, you know how I talk about the perennial tradition. If it keeps recurring, um, then it has a good likelihood of being true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you only find that intergenerationally. Right. Even to know history, to know, right. yeah, to know yeah. the tradition. Yeah. We have, we have these, um, like, these prophecies in our tribe of oh. kind of, 
it's kind of, they tell the story of our tribe throughout the years. So the stories of colonization when Europeans came and you know how we yeah. took on Christianity and, yeah. and the, the seventh generation, which is kind of what we believe we're in right now, is this time oh. when the young people will come back to our ways again, or they have the choice. Do you want to sort of, do you want to stay colonized or do you want to decolonize and return to who we are, return to our languages and our teachings? Yes. And I think about that all the time, not just for me, but my own children, because I'm kind of coming back to myself, to the whole of my identity. I'm trying to integrate all of who I am. Mm -hmm. And I want my children to know how to do that from a young age. And um, yes. it's difficult, but I, but they are so ready to have these conversations. And I'm surprised all the time at how they get, they get it so much. Yes. And you know, uh, our big teaching here, and uh, the important thing is you, you teach it in a include and transcend way, include mm -hmm. and transcend. That's the art form. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we never allowed you to include. Uh, yeah. yeah. It was all by our analysis, period. And that's not fair. It's not true. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I really wanted to frame Native as, you know, a, um, an invitation. Like I, I, want, I wanted to tell these stories and ask the questions in the book to invite people to examine themselves and examine their own identity and examine their own ways of viewing God. And I hoped that it would be, you know, not a, like I want it to be challenging, but I want it to be invitational as well, that we can enter into these spaces together, you know, and because people shut down so easily if they are yeah, challenged, yeah. you know? And well, I, think, I think you achieved it, Caitlin. I really do. I'm not flattering you. It, it, the whole book is invitational uh, and that's what people need right now that we're yeah. just so scared and so hurt and and where this uh, pandemic is going to lead none of us know but it doesn't make for open-minded thinking and understanding yeah. it, it it makes for cowering and there's nothing in your book that encourages that Thank you. you know yeah all right i don't want to take up too much more of your time so i'll oh no, you're not taking it off are you okay you're, well i know you're busy it's amazing all that but that doesn't matter <laughs> keep going keep going all right i'm gonna read another poem all right okay every now and then we should hear the coffee mug clank as we set it back down on the glass tabletop, because there is nothing to distract us from its presence. We should listen for the creaking beams of an old house whose bones ache with a kind of architectural osteoporosis. Uh -huh. We should listen for her groans because they remind us that history lives. And more often than not, the hummingbirds should get our full attention because they teach us what it means to gulp the nectar of life. They teach us to remember that we too are small thirsty things looking for the river to drink from, or at least a refreshing fountain. Wow. You know, here in New Mexico, uh, the hummingbird is the uh, metaphor image of what we would call the Holy Spirit. Mm. So you'll see it often on the pottery and in drawings yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh that's beautiful yeah i um i think there's this tension between or that we have these ideas that if you're an activist if you're this person you're out there all the time you're you're naming all these truths right and you're challenging the status quo that you can't also be the quiet person who sits and listens and pays attention like sometimes we we like pit those ideas against each other when actually they need to work together. Um, mm -hmm. I found that writing this book was really difficult because, you know, it's going through a lot of my trauma and a lot of really hard, difficult topics. And I would have to force myself into the quiet to like fill up again. You know, mm -hmm. it was, um, it was really difficult. Um, and I knew that I needed things like this where I could just stare out a window for a little while. 
Well, I think that filling up is apparent. That you didn't write from a cynical, negative space while still acknowledging your disappointment anger. Right. It, and that's what it more is to me. And disappointment anger, I mean, I here I am a Franciscan and a priest, but I experience it in regard to Christianity too. Mm -hmm. And ironically, it gives me a, a window uh, of freedom, uh, not, not a reaction, I hope, but an action of ability to act freely. And it seems to me you've achieved that in your book. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, especially during the virus right now and we're staying home and we're feeling very restless and, and um, kind of a panic of not knowing what to do or if we're doing enough. And, yes, yes. you know, is it enough to just take the time to listen and to reflect and to be still, you know, that doesn't feel like it's enough, but we need to remember that it helps us move forward in what we need to do. You know, it helps us do the right things that we need to do, that we might be called to do. I, um, during the pandemic, I created something on my website called Essential Love Letters. Um, wow. Because I use words, that's my thing that I use, you know, and I was feeling so restless and panicking, what do I do? You know, I can't donate money everywhere, but I can use words, you know, and so I created a, a thing on my website where people could submit if they need a word of encouragement. Like if they're just really struggling, they could send their email address to me. And then other people would write these love letters, just anonymous love letters, and I would pair them and I would send them to the person anonymously. And oh. it's just been beautiful to see how people oh. are using poetry and they're sending meditative practices that they use to these strangers just to say like, I know that this is really hard for you right now. And I want to, I want to offer you the things that help me. And it's just been beautiful to read through those and see people really giving of themselves. Yeah. I enjoy that too. I get the most heartfelt letters and emails too many to keep up with, <laughs> I bet you do. but they're still wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Okay. I'm going to, well, in, um, we're going to go ahead and end here. I'm going to read one more poem and then one we'll, more poem, please. we'll say goodbye. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Oh, a joy for me. Thank you. This is, um, so I ended the book with, with talking about the children. I kind of wanted to end the book with saying, you know, the hope of all of us is who comes later. And whether it's our own children or it's just all of our children, like they are our future generations. And so the very, um, on page 179, it's at the very end of the book. Um, 179. I'm just going to follow along with you. Okay, okay, there it is. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's sort of a poem prayer. I kind of mix those two together a lot. So this is at the end of the book. Prayer is only a whisper of what could be, what is, the memory of what was yesterday, 10 minutes ago, when we last blinked and realized that what you are is something we cannot grasp, but long to know in the depths of us. Make room, for we are simply beginning, the sprout that will grow and form the landscape of tomorrow. Breathe on us, we pray. Eo. Amen. 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 So there's that sort of sending off of, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to be, but we want, you know, we want to be breathed on. We want to feel that wholeness and seek it out. So. Mm. Well, I hope this gets a wide reading and that eventually you get to go on the road with it. <laughs> yeah, it hopefully. Has has it started uh, to sell at least? Yeah, it's doing great, you know, oh, and people good. have been good, 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 so good, kind good. and, you know, so yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm grateful for all the support. I mean, we live in an online world already, so yes. having that has been really amazing. Um, but I do hope to see people in person one day, but yes. until then we have Zoom <laughs> and things like this. So <laughs> yeah. 
but delightful. Well, everybody, this is a little gem. <laughs> Thank Take you. advantage of it. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Richard. God bless you. Stay safe. You're a dear. Thank you. Dear, dear, dear. <laughs> Thank you. We'll talk soon. <laughs>